Hello and welcome to the Wikimedia Foundation's Human Rights Amidst Rising Anti-LGBTQ Efforts Online Workshop. I'm from the Human Rights Team at the Foundation and I'll be, you, during this workshop, be walking you through some steps you can take to ensure you are more safe and secure online during a really unfortunate and uh, unbelievable rise in anti-LGBTQ sentiment around the world. First, I want to briefly discuss some of the threats to the movement and what the human rights team does and why we're here. Um, in 2020, there was a, the foundation conducted a human rights impact assessment, which identified a lot of threats that were facing the movement. Some of these threats come from author, authoritarian regimes uh, during a real rise in authoritarianism around the world and a subsequent decline in online freedom. Some of these, some more of these threats also come from democratic governments who are you know, conducting various, you know, having various regulations related to national security um, or trying to mitigate other online harms. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see some of the threats to the movement that we've identified. These are really important and serious threats to the future of, a, of the Wikimedia movement. And the foundation took the results of the impact assessment seriously, which resulted in the creation of a human rights team. And the human rights team um, aims to improve the safety of individuals who are persecuted for their good faith participation in the Wikimedia movement. Yes, I read that right off the slide. Um, but that's what we're here to do. And, uh, you know, there's the Wikimedia movement is a global movement. Uh, and, you know, there's many different political contexts in which people live. And the foundation can't be everywhere. So one of the key pillars of how the human rights team uh, works is to develop global partnerships with international, national, regional, local uh, human rights uh, NGOs, uh, you know, advocates, uh, legal teams, and so on, in order to be able to support individuals around the world who might be persecuted because they're part of the Wikimedia movement. We also have a human rights interest group, which is a way we connect with uh, members of the community, and you're welcome uh, to join. Uh, you, we have a meta page for the human rights team that has more information, but it's a uh, interest group where we you know, have semi-regular meetings with members of the community to get a better sense of what's going on for them and what are the human rights threats that they might be facing or what other ideas might they have so that the foundation can better support them. We also conducted a lot of education and training and also online courses. We have some in, in the Wikilearn platform. Um, and we also, of course, right, this is one of them here, uh, this, this workshop. So we conduct education and training to help individuals in the movement be, feel safer and be safer. Um, we work with uh, global uh, advocacy on the human rights policy on implementation and also on various other aspects of it and we contribute to human rights due diligence that's conducted at the foundation on the various projects that are going on so this is what in a, in a quick nutshell what the human rights team does the wikimedia foundation you can email us if you would like to ever talk with us at talk to human rights at wikimedia.org okay so a little bit of a background now uh, on what's going on with global LGBTQ plus rights. As a human rights professional, it's been extremely uh, disheartening and, and, and really saddening for the, team, the entire team and myself to read about a, a lot of rollbacks of LGBTQ rights, and a lot of challenges that are going on around the world. Um, there's been a lot of progress uh, over the past 20, 30 years, it's certainly in my lifetime, it's been remarkable and inspiring. Uh, we can see here at least uh, out of 56 out of 175 countries, you know, had an increase in LGBTQ plus acceptance, but at the same time, nearly an equal number also experienced a decline and, and 62 countries stayed roughly the same. Uh, globally, in North America in 2022, law, in, in the United States, uh, lawmakers proposed over 200 bills to limit the rights of LGBTQ Americans. In Canada, anti-hate experts are really concerned in a rise of online harassment and threats and the persecution of, in, of LGBT, LGBTQ plus individuals and online events and offline events that are associated uh, with online activities, uh, which it's 
it's a global issue. This is not something that's confined to global south or global north. Um, in Latin America, Human Rights Watch uh, interviewed individuals from the Northern Triangle who described a real complex web of violence, discrimination, uh, harassment that is really threatening the way their right to live a healthy and happy lives and has unfortunately resulted in many of them having to flee their countries. And it's really hard uh, to you know, leave your country, leave everything you've known, you know, who you are, your friends, your, your support networks, the places that are meaningful to you, the people that are meaningful to you. Um, you know, and, and this is happening around the world. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in Asia, uh, online hate speech and violence against LGBTQ uh, plus people uh, really increased in, in Asia, especially including uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, it, it became increasingly an everyday reality for LGBTQ plus individuals in Southeast Asia while navigating online spaces. And this is also not so the, the online harassment isn't something that's limited to Asia or Canada, Canada uh, or Latin America. This is a, it truly is a global phenomenon and it, it can be transnational where it, you can be harassed for, you know, by somebody from a completely other country simply because you've, you know, visibly somehow identified as LGBTQ plus on social media geographic breakdown it's important to keep in mind that this is while this is occurring in countries it's also un uh, unfortunately transnational um, in africa there has been a, a real rise also in uh, legal efforts to uh, to attack the lgbtq plus community um, we have we see in kenya ghana senegal uganda and tanzania uh, there's been a, an increase actually in physical and online threats over the just the past three months And unfortunately, in the Middle East, um, there have been governments across the region are targeting the LGBTQ plus community. Some governments actually have used uh, online dating apps to be able to identify who uh, might be LGBTQ plus and then harass them or subject them to public shaming and so on. And in Europe, uh, there's been an increase in rights violations for LGBTQ plus uh, individuals in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in North Macedonia. Um, and there's been widespread disinformation campaigns uh, across the EU. And just as I mentioned earlier, also this uh, really tragic uh, increase in online hate speech, online harassment and intimidation. It, you know, we often go online to feel in a way for many people more ourselves you know, we can be in a space where we can engage more freely, ask questions, do research that we're curious about, um, and, and generally explore parts of ourselves and parts of our experience, which we might not feel comfortable doing offline. And so when we see the online space closing to that, you know, we also are losing an important part of ourselves, you know, that part of ourselves that uh, explores privately, explores anonymously. And so the closing of online spaces in the restriction of online spaces to LGBTQ plus individuals around the world is an enormously problematic also from the individual perspective on how one lives one's life. Um, but so how do these threats that we're talking about here actually manifest in the Wikimedia movement? Uh, um, excuse me. You know, the internet, you know, a while ago, people used to talk about, oh, um, on my online, my offline life. But as most of us know now, that line is increasingly blurred. There's very little distinction between what is online or offline. You know, we do every, we do so much of our life online, you know, sharing photos, you know, paying people back, you know, sharing stories, you know, taking our classes, getting degrees. And as a Wikimedia uh, member of the Wikimedia movement, you know, contributing to the world's knowledge on such a really important project. Um, but, you know, as a result of that sharing and, and collaborating and, and working and connecting online, you know, we're putting more information out there. And uh, this information becomes pretty easily accessible and can open up many people to, ha to these harms that we've talked about, such, you know, harassment, stalking, bullying, impersonation, swatting, hate speech and doxing. And doxing is extremely dangerous uh, part of this, excuse me. Um, which you know is where your personal information like your home address or your work address or phone number or so on uh, is shared online as a way to intimidate you. Um, so with that, we'll talk a little bit about harassment and cyber bullying here. Um, these kind of harms typically manifest you know in threats of violence, whether they're online threats of violence, which would be like, for example, hacking or uh, you know 
posting obscene or hateful mean things to your social media accounts or personally emailing you um you know trying to impersonate others or, or you to harass you uh creating you know sock puppets on wiki gender-based or sexuality-based insults racist racist xenophobic homophobic comments um and so on and this and these manifest online and they can also manifest you know through sms uh through whatsapp telegram uh, Facebook groups, wherever, because Wikimedia community, as as you all know, doesn't just communicate on Wiki. It communicates through a variety of channels, and we have seen that this appear can appear, you know, on Wiki, can appear on social media, it can appear in private uh, channels everywhere. So it's important to keep that in mind that these, when we're talking about you know safety and security here, it's not just what happens on Wiki, but also what happens off Wiki. As I mentioned briefly earlier, doxing is a particularly problematic and nefarious issue because it's a, first of all, it's an extreme breach of your privacy. Um, it's a type of a digital abuse. And so what they'll do is they basically take, you know, they they conduct an immense amount of research. And also what a, what a waste of time for that these individuals are actually doing this. But nonetheless, you know, they do do this incredibly. And they'll spend an enormous amount of time trying to find out exactly who you are um, and then you, and using whether online resources or potentially offline resources, in, in the case of really nefarious individuals who have you know, connections in law enforcement or other parts of the government, to be able to find out per, very personal information about you and put it online. And this is a way to intimidate you, harass you, to basically get you to shut up and to go off to go offline. And we have also seen this happening to LGBTQ plus individuals around the world with the idea of being to, to make them feel very unsafe in their homes um, and to encourage them to leave the platform. Um, and it's it's quite an unfortunately easy thing to do. You know, many of us have, we use the uh, our real names on Wiki or we have, you know, personally identifiable information on our user pages. Uh, so it's not, too hard for somebody who's motivated by hate and has nothing else to do to actually find the information out about you. Okay, so there's these threats. We've talked a little bit, we've talked about some of them. And so how can you actually protect yourself in the midst of these rising threats? Um, as I talked a bit in the beginning, you know, these technologies are really amazing. You know, I, when I was a teenager, I first got a computer, um, and it came with a free online, a free uh, encyclopedia on CD-ROM, not online. Um, and I was just to spend so much time going through this stuff. I even didn't go on um, dates because I'm just so addicted to this encyclopedia. So when I got older, and of course, when Wikipedia came online, oh my goodness, this was this was heaven on earth because this was so much to explore. And so uh, my my point is uh, is. And to go down the rabbit hole with Wikipedia, as you all know. Um, but my point is that these technologies are extremely powerful in a very positive sense. But you know, at this, with any technology as it emerges, there's multiple ways it can be used, and, uh, and it will inevitably include parts, ways in which it can be used, you know, in in a bad way, in a negative way. So these the technologies that we have that are out there, uh, they carry this positive side and they carry this negative side, and. Unfortunately, a lot of emphasis in the Wikimedia movement has been on the positive side, you know, and this is really great. This is, you don't have a Wikimedia movement. You don't create, you know, this incredible encyclopedia, this incredible resource, unless you view the technology positively. But that can tend to blind us from the negative side of things, and that, and that's not to take away from the positive positive side, but for us to be mindful of the negative side and take steps that we can to uh, limit how harmful that side can be. So to protect yourself against harassment and bullying. And, and I just want to uh, make a, a mention here before we get started. Um, we are, the human rights team will be publishing some blog posts uh, quite soon. Uh, and and today uh, is April 11th. Um, and we'll be publishing quite soon in 2023. <laughs> I don't know when you'll be watching this, but anyway, we'll be publishing some blog posts uh, that have to deal with uh, ways to mitigate doxing and other harassment as well, as an addition to this. So just to be mindful, and of course that there'll be uh, this will be announced, and you'll be able to find that online too. Um, so if you're being harassed by somebody online, you know consider asking some of these what we call like red flag questions. Um, 
do you think that this person might know where you live or know other personal details about you? For example, have you, you know, have you been in, let's say, uh, telegram channels or signal groups where you've chatted and maybe shared what city you're in or even, you know, what neighborhood stores you shop at? Um, have they made threatening comments? Are there threats specific? Now, the specific is important uh, because somebody can make quite generic threats. And of course, that's very scary. I myself have received these kind of threats in the past. But it's the ones that are very specific, which might indicate that this person might be closer to you than you think or have access to information about you. And these are the ones particularly to be mindful of. Do their, are their claims you know, irrational or erratic? Do they have a history of online violent behavior that you are aware of? So these are, those, are, those are some questions. I'm sorry, I'll go back uh, just to finish that up before we get into doxing. So uh, these are some questions to be mindful of to help you understand and sort of take control of the risk that is coming, the information that's coming to you. Because sometimes we can receive, we might receive a threat and it can make us feel really scared. Um, but then when we look at the threat, we can, we can see, although it's scary, that there's a, not much likelihood that this is anything that's real. You know, that's really, there's a real threat here, offline threat, if you will. Um, so it's why it's important to, to take a look at some of this information and use these questions to see, is this a very credible threat or is this, is unfortunately, an extremely toxic uh, person? And when we have a sense of control over the, the threats or the feelings that we have, then we're actually able to take more effective action, which might be, you know, limiting information or so on, so on uh, contacting law enforcement. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. As I mentioned earlier, uh, doxing is, to my mind, an extremely dangerous and worrisome and very scary uh, threat. Um, so one of the, we'll be publishing, as I mentioned earlier, a blog post about doxing. And uh, one of the best things you can do if you, if this is of concern, if you are concerned that your information is out there and that it might be shared uh, or somebody might be able to connect the dots or you've gotten one of those notifications that your data was part of some data breach in the past you know many of these companies get hacked and then the information gets out there and it's not you know you can buy this data on the black market very cheap you know for a hundred dollars a hundred euros around that for, for access to some of this data um, and then the information could be found in that way it's really really quite good uh, for you to go th to conduct Google and Bing and other search engines, you know, DuckDuckGo or whatever you might use, um, searches to be able to see on your real name, on your your username that you use online on on Wiki, or on other social media platforms, on perhaps some nicknames that you might have, um, and this includes stuff you made when you were a teenager or a kid, you know, which oftentimes that can come back to to you know bite us, so to speak, um, and. Seeing what's out there, uh, doing a Google image search on any Im images you might have contributed to comments or pictures of yourself, uh, you know, and getting a sense, you know, of, of what you have out there. And, and, and in that way, you can contact some of the websites uh, to, to ask the content to be removed. Um, I remember when my, my father passed away. Uh, I was concerned that you know his information would be used because it can be a common scam. His you know information can be used to you know create you know open fake uh, bank accounts and uh, credit accounts. So uh, I did this type of exact approach and went through and found lots of information about him. And he was he was a person who wasn't very you know online really. Uh, but nonetheless, the stuff was out there, and I was able to. It was a really <laughs> took a while, but contact each website um, and get that information removed. And now there's nothing, which is I figure also a way I can honor him, too. But for us who are here, um, you know, doing this is also really important for taking control of our information out there. And even if you've done it once, it's really good to go through periodically. I still periodically would do a search for information about my father, and sometimes stuff still pops up. So, phishing is something that we didn't really talk about before, and phishing is also particularly dangerous. Um, phishing is when you get an email uh, or like an SMS message uh, or a message, you know, on, on WhatsApp or an, another online group, which tries to entice you into downloading a file or clicking on a link, which can then install uh, malicious software known as malware on your computer. Uh, and so phishing will often look like it's it will often be framed or look like it's from somebody you know or about something you're you know interested in or something rev you know resonant for you. 
um, you might get an email, let's say you've participated in a lot of um, various uh, wiki events, right? And you might then get an email uh, that might invite you to a new wiki event. And this, you know, it'll say something like, possibly I'm you know, making this up, uh, you know, that you can, uh, you know, we'd love to invite you to this event and uh, please, you know, fill out this form so we can pay, you know, have your accommodations ready. But actually when you download that form, it actually contains malware on it that then installs on your computer and tracks everything you, you do and sends it off to some other third party. So it's important, as you know, we talked about with the with the doxing earlier, um, you know, to be mindful of the information that's out there about you online, because then people can use that information to actually craft a more convincing uh, letter for you, or email, or message, or whatever it might be for you. Right. So you know, see, it doesn't mean to go and erase everything. You know, if you're participating in these events and you you know have a a username that's not your real name and so on, um, that's you know fine. But and of course, you, you it's really wonderful when we share our achievements and our accomplishments. Um, but just knowing that that's out there and that that sounds too good to be true, just might be, uh, is really worthwhile. And double checking the email addresses that they're from, not downloading files from unknown sources. If you do need to download it, uh, open the document, like if it's a PDF or a Word document, uh, Microsoft Word document or LibreOffice document or whatever it might be, open it in like for example gmail because it has the you know, you know the online actually viewer inside you know uh gmail you know for instance you can save the file to your drive there and then open it in the, the the google drive for example and then open it in google drive if you don't have a gmail account for various reasons or ideological reasons uh, related to the you know the company's use of data i still would encourage you to create an account um, that you would just use for these purposes. If there's something you're not feeling, you know, you're kind of skeptical about opening, um, you just and you'd rather just use the Google Drive just to do that. That's a great feature that Google does have. Other ways of keeping safe. It's an unfortunate reality, but that we need to think twice about what we post, what we share, what we like, or how we co what we comment on online, because we start to build sort of the digital footprints. This is why, you know, I think it's, you know, the, we, we often think of these things in the human scale, but sophisticated actors can employ AI systems, uh, machine learning systems, you know, and, you know, other sophisticated to be able to find out, th you know, what are the posts, the tweets you've liked on Twitter, for example. Um, it's not too difficult to find that stuff out. So, and that can give clue to how you might get fished or that might give a, you know, clue into how to dox you. For example, if you're on Twitter and you or Facebook and you like a lot of very, very specifically local pages, let's say, or follow very specifically local Twitter accounts, it's wonderful, right? I enjoy that too. Yeah, I love it. I, it's important to know what's going on in your community. But that also gives a clue to where you are. <laughs> so, um, so it's not to not do that, but to be mindful of what you're following, right? Um, you know, posting very personal information, such as a birth date, um, such as a you know a maiden name, you know the names of your parents. Uh, you know that can also be stuff that can be used against you. Ensure that your phone number is nowhere online, or if you do need to have something like that, you can you know purchase a phone number from you know like Google or Skype uh, for a very low cost. I believe that uh, for Skype you can have a phone number for less than fifty euros a year. Um, and on social networks, including and that includes LinkedIn and professional networks, you know, be mindful to accept, you know, uh, friend requests or contact requests from people you know or are that you know of. It's a increasingly common tactic uh, to use, for example, LinkedIn and other professional networks to be able to, you know, infiltrate and harass uh, people's social networks. And uh, if you have if you have not done so you can also limit the kind of content you're tagged in in social media you can also set it so that you have to manually approve every tag so that you cannot be tagged in something without your consent and that's a really really important way to actually uh address some of the concerns that can come from just being tagged in things that you might not want to be tagged in and it also it put it can put you know your friends at, at risk of harassment as well because now they're associated with you so in addition, um, 
when you if you're posting home photographs of your home or selfies, you know, be mindful of what the background is and any anything that's really identifiable that could indicate its location. You would be genuinely surprised at the efforts people go through to be able to identify where people are located. In fact, there was a case that was recently out of Japan where an individual had posted a, you know, a selfie and they were wearing glasses and somebody use the reflection in the glasses, a stalker, to be able to find out where they were located. Incredible, right? So um, these you don't know who's out there. And uh, it's not to not take selfies or not to enjoy you know, digital life, but be mindful of these things. If you've not spent time going through your privacy settings of your social media apps, um, of your phone, you know, I really encourage you to take some time, set aside an hour or two, and just go through it and be sure everything is set the way you like. A, a real plus side of the past few years has, has been a lot of pressure from civil society on, you know, pushing social media companies to include an enormous amount of privacy control. So take advantage of that that's been done to help protect uh, people around the world. Uh, I would strongly recommend also deactivating geolocation on your accounts. Uh, unless you know it's particularly relevant, um, these can be used to identify where you are. They can also be used to identify patterns in your daily life where you might go. If every day around 12 you post a selfie um, at a cafe, you know that might give an indication to where you might be every day at 12. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the background of videos and photos before publishing them. Just double check them to be sure you're comfortable with them. It's okay for you. Um, and then I also encourage you to report suspicious or threatening accounts to the social media platforms. And also, if things are happening to you on Wiki, uh, to report them to the human rights team at talktohumanrights at wikimedia.org. That's talk to, which is the, the word to, T-O, humanrights at wikimedia.org. So, you know, I would also might be in terms of more wiki specific uh, ways to address some of these issues. Uh, consider developing a secondary account, you know, uh, especially if your primary account, your know, main account, might be easily identifiable, or if you attend events in person. Um, you know, this might be if you're, you know, in a situation. Let's say you're passionate about political topics, but you've got a main account where you work a lot. Let's say, on, uh, you know plants and animals in, in your country or your region, um, you might want to s separate the two and have an account that works on political, which is not connected to that one. And also to be mindful that it is not too hard for people to be able to figure out who you are from the kind of edits you make, because we tend to edit the things that we know. Uh, many people often start with you know stuff about the city they know or cities, places they've lived. Um, as the, the slide says here, which is really true, you know, if you are vulnerable, be boring. <laughs> and that's a, a, quite radical to be boring in a world that really wants us to not be so boring, but it can actually be the, a very wise way to be online. Um, so having a, a, to build on this more, you know, having a Wikimedia only email address for correspondence, which is not tied to your identity, is, is an extremely good idea. And, you know, separating your Wikimedia activities in that way. Um, if you are going to meet people in person, this is something, uh, you know, I would really recommend you to think quite carefully about, um, especially close to home. You know, if there's a chance to meet, for example, in a bigger city, in a public location, or someplace a bit quite far away, I think that's a really wise thing to do. You, you don't, and it might not be that the person that you are meeting has any particular nefarious, you know, purposes, but you don't know who they know, who they talk with. And this is where we've, we've often seen people in, in quite innocently share information about where you know, vulnerable members of the movement are located and it can cause problems for them. So actions, <laughs> uh, actions that the Wikimedia Foundation can take are <clears throat> dictated by our global policies, uh, but information is bounded only by safety and, and legal concerns. So it's really, really important extremely helpful to us as i mentioned earlier we like to listen to the community we very much believe in a you know quote unquote bottoms up approach and community up approach so you know and we view this you know engagement with the lgbtq plus community uh, as a long-term engagement um, because of unfortunately the persistent global threats 
that are out there. So having any any advice, any wisdom, any opportunities to work together that you might have would be extremely, you know, appreciated. Um, and we won't attribute, you know, we weren't, aren't going to publicly name you or attribute any tips or advice to you, you know, unless, you know, we have a conversation, this is something you're generally interested in.